Uh, this is uh, Fright Makers 101 at Texas Frightmare Weekend. Uh, my name is Preston Vossel. Uh, I've been writing for various uh, horror outlets now for several years. Uh, my story, as you'll hear, actually begins right here at Texas Frightmare Weekend uh, back in 2013. Uh, I was expecting a lot less of you, so forgive me if there's a little bit of nervousness on my part. I was expecting to play to a crowd of about eight. <laughs> uh, so I really appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, I know that you had a choice in panels today, and I thank you for choosing this one. We acknowledge that uh, you're seeing this over the thing in the Hills Have Eyes, which is uh, really flattering, so thank you again. Uh, can everybody hear me? Can people in the back hear me? Do I need to speak up a little bit louder? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, first panel I've ever done, so uh, this is going to be as informative for me as it is for everyone here. Uh, what I figured I would do is kind of tell my story, uh, how I got to this point, uh, everything I've done to get to the point where I am talking to you here at Texas Frightmare Weekend, and then after that, uh, open the floor to questions. Um, it's probably the latent Catholic in me, but uh, everybody say hello to one another. Uh, coming here every year is uh, kind of like a you know, kind of like a homecoming for me. Uh, 362 days a year, I look forward to coming back to Texas Frightmare Weekend. Uh, I've been coming here for seven years now, and the very first time I came here, I walked through the doors, and I looked out at all the people here, and the very first thought I had was, I'm home. And that has been my feeling for the past seven years. So, you know, look around you, see the people here. This is, this is our tribe. These are our people. These are other horror fans. I don't know how often you get to see one another over the course of the year. I don't know how many long-term friends there are here, long-distance friends, but uh, that's just uh, something I've always appreciated about Texas Frightmare Weekend. Anyway, uh, so my story actually starts in an eye doctor's office. Uh, after I got out of college, I uh, went and started working for an eye doctor selling eyeglasses in a uh, little town called Magnolia outside of Houston. And we subscribed to a newsletter and a print magazine there. Uh, the newsletter was called The Optician's Handbook. The magazine was called 2020. They were both put out by a company called Jobs and Publishing. And in the downtime, in between seeing patients, in between making sales, I would read the newsletter, read the magazine. And one day, I came across what I thought was just the absolute most terrible article I had ever read in my life in this magazine, this newsletter, or anything. Grammatically, it was terrible. Syntactically, it was terrible. It barely seemed to have a point, and whatever point it did seem to be making, to me, seems to be lie to your patients to make a sale. And I just thought that was awful, because I'd prided myself on not only being an honest salesman, but also speaking well and writing well. So it offended me on multiple fronts. And so I wrote what was admittedly a very bitchy, very pissy letter to the editor. And I actually took a paragraph from this article, pasted it into an email, and like diagrammed this thing. Like I was some like stern, like button-collared high school English teacher. Said, well, this sentence should say this, and this sentence should say this, and this sentence shouldn't even be in here at all. And the rest of it was just super pissy. And thinking back on it that night, I was just thinking to myself, whoever reads this letter is going to think that they have just gotten an email from the biggest, most pretentious jackass in the world. <laughs> and then a week later, I got a response. Never expected that. Never expected a response, one. Never expected a response from the editor of the newsletter. Said, thank you for your feedback went back and reviewed it, and you're right. It's uh, you know, not, maybe not necessarily something that we should have run, and uh, you know, we thank you for bringing this to our attention. And a uh, gentleman's name was uh, Mark Madison Shufnick. He's a great guy, I still work with him. Uh, and he said to me in the email, looking back, I don't know how, uh, how half-hearted this was, how tongue-in-cheek this was, if maybe he wasn't being a, a little bit pissy back to me, he says, well, you know, you write so well, why don't you try submitting an article to us? And maybe that was sarcastic, I don't know, but I have a very poor ability to read sarcasm, so I thought to myself, oh, cool, he wants me to submit an article to him. <laughs> 
And so I went home that night and I sat down and uh, one of the reasons, other than I've always been interested in science, always loved science, I have a science degree from Sam Houston State University right here in Texas. How many native Texans here? All right. Uh, I've been interested in science, but I've always in been interested in the history of eyeglasses, uh, antique optics, uh, antique eyeglass frames. That was one of the reasons that I decided to pursue a career in optics after I got out of school. And so I went home, sat down, and wrote out this article documenting like the entire history of pince-nez eyeglasses. Um, Morpheus in the... Uh, Thank you, yeah, where there's uh, no temples, there's just the bridge, it attaches directly to the nose, and I go home and I write out this entire article documenting the history of this style of glasses from beginning to end, and I say, I think it'd be a really interesting addition to this newsletter if there is a recurring feature about the history of different types of eyeglasses, different eyeglass companies, uh, different types of eyeglass lenses, and here is my first entry in that. I hope you like it. And I get a response back to that. This is great. How would you like to write for us on a regular basis? We would like to hire you. And so overnight, or over a matter of a couple of weeks, I went from some pissy guy sitting in an eye doctor's office sending angry letters to the editor to actually writing for this newsletter as a paid member of the staff. Goes on for about a year. That's uh, 2012. Moving into 2013, a couple of different things happened. 13 turned out to be a pretty lucky number for me other than the fact I got pneumonia that November and almost died. But I'm going to ignore that part. I'm going to ignore that part. Uh, 2013, first thing that happens is I get an email one day from a guy named James Spina. And James Spina, if you ever have the fortune to meet him, is one of the nicest, sweetest, most encouraging people you will ever meet. And he was the editor of 2020 Magazine, which was the print edition, for lack of a better word, of Optician's Handbook, the newsletter that we subscribe to. It's an actual print magazine. I like to call it Vogue, but for eyeglasses. Uh, it goes out to eye doctor's offices. It goes out to eyeglass stores. If you work in the optical field, then you can subscribe to 2020, and you get articles on new types of lenses and new types of eyeglass frames and interviews with frame designers and yada, yada, yada. And I had written this article on why vintage style eyeglasses are coming back. And looking out on this room, I see that you all understand exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I called it the Mad Men Effect. Somebody else coined that term first, but I went ahead and used it too because I thought it was appropriate and talked about how television show Mad Men had had such an effect on the world of fashion to the point that it was affecting optics now. And I kind of tied in the idea that uh, vintage style in menswear and womenswear was going to spill over to eyeglass fashion as well. And one of the reasons that we were seeing all of these vintage styles coming back was reflective on this larger trend of vintage clothes. And when I wrote the article, I really wasn't sure what angle I wanted to attack it from. And so I was a little bit catty, I was a little bit flip, and I kind of wrote it in the style of a Don Draper pitch from the show Mad Men, because I always loved the show. I always loved Don Draper's pitches, Carousel. And so I wrote the article like Don Draper giving a pitch to the team at Sterling Cooper, Sterling Cooper Draper Price, Sterling Cooper Draper Price, whatever the hell they were in the sixth season. <laughs> And uh, James Spina, editor 2020, sends me this email and he says, uh, I was just scrolling through all of the new articles in Optician's Handbook in the newsletter. It was kind of a mad day. It was a Monday. And after I read this article, it just cracked me up and I just absolutely loved it. How would you like to start submitting content to the Prince Edition 2020 magazine? And so... 2013 became the year that I also started writing for 2020. Now, 2013 also turned out to be a momentous year for me on the horror writing front as well, because just like all the other moves I had made, I found myself accidentally stumbling into becoming a horror writer. Uh, very first year that I came to Texas Frightmare Weekend was 2011. 2013 was my second year. And over the course of the previous year, I had been thinking about putting together some kind of article on a woman named Vanessa Howard. Now, Vanessa Howard, some of you may know the name. I'm guessing not because we're all American here, and I don't think anybody knows about her outside of the United Kingdom except for me and two other guys. 
but uh, she was in a very small number of British horror films back in the 1960s, and the most prominent one was one called Gurley, which was directed by Freddie Francis. Uh, this was Freddie Francis's passion project. He had always wanted to make a film. Oh, wow, I'm doing really good. Uh, he had always wanted to make a film at a place called Oakley Court, uh, which, if you look it up, has a fascinating history. It is a castle in England that was turned into first uh, a film studio and then a hotel. And if you go to England, you can actually stay in a hotel that used to be a Victorian era castle. And they shot movies there back in the 1950s. It was also used as public housing for some reason. Um, England has a radically different idea of what constitutes public housing as opposed to the United <laughs> States. Uh, and Freddie Francis had uh, done all of these uh, Hammer films there, a cinematographer, and there were always exterior shot there. Uh, anybody here has seen the Rocky Horror Picture Show, you've seen Oakley Court. Oakley Court is the exteriors of Dr. Frankenfurter's castle. And you can actually go over to England and stay a night there now. It's a beautiful place. If you ever get the opportunity to make it over there, I strongly recommend it. And Freddie Francis had always said, you know, nobody ever wants to shoot inside of Oakley Court. Because at this point, the inside of the place was absolutely falling apart. Uh, it had passed through multiple hands before it finally fell into the hands of the British government. And they let the inside of the place basically rot, took care of the outside so it looked nice. And Freddie Francis thought, well, the inside of this place falling apart Victorian castle. Why don't you shoot a movie there? And so he shot this movie called Gurley, starred this actress named Vanessa Howard, who, if you see this film, I recommend everybody does. It's available on DVD from Scorpion. And it is this tour de force performance. But it, uh, ran, it came out at the exact same time that there was this backlash against horror films in England. There was kind of this moral panic. And it and Goodbye Gemini, uh, stars Judy Geeson, she's here, go talk to her about it. She is the sweetest person, and if you tell her that you're a fan of Goodbye Gemini or you'd like to hear about Goodbye Gemini, you will get some good stories. Uh, but so Gurley and Goodbye Gemini come out, I'm getting back to a point here, trust me. Uh, Gurley and Goodbye Gemini come out at the same time. There is a huge backlash against uh, sleazier horror films in English uh, culture, and both of these movies pretty much bomb at the box office. Uh, Vanessa Howard at that point had really been struggling. Uh, Freddie Francis and a couple of other people had told her that this was going to be her star vehicle. This was going to be her big break. She's very dejected and she actually ends up marrying uh, Robert Chardoff who produced all the Rocky films. Retires from acting, moves to the United States and just spends the rest of her life as this Hollywood wife. And apparently disappears off the radar. And in 2012 I stumbled across an obituary for her and realized that she had died at the age of 62 after divorcing Robert Chardoff at some point. And so I thought to myself, you have got this fascinating untold story here. You have got this British actress who had been in films with Peter Cushing. She had, uh, you know, almost reached the heights of stardom and then nothing works out for her, moves to the United States, apparently disappears for something to the tune of 20, 30 years, and then just turns up dead at 62. And I thought to myself, I would love to tell her story because I had found a VHS of Gurley in the clearance bin of a video store back in Oklahoma where I grew up. Uh, my brother and I, sitting over here, wave. <laughs> my brother and I would spend our Friday nights growing up in Oklahoma at video stores. Friday night, school's out, off to Hollywood Video off to Blockbuster, off to Warehouse Market. And Warehouse Market, nobody here has heard of it. If you have, I'd be shocked because nobody in Oklahoma had heard of Warehouse Market, except that maybe they sold bad meat once in a while. But in the front corner of this obscure grocery store is the best video store you have ever been to. They had the rarest, weirdest stuff there. That's where I first saw Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Uh, that's where I would have seen Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers if somebody hadn't have stolen the tape. I would <laughs> still love to know that story. I still want to know who took that. And uh, one day I was there and they had a clearance bin right at the beginning of, uh, of DVDs, the dawn of DVDs. This is about 2004. 
and they are selling off every VHS that nobody has rented for over 18 months. And one of them is this movie, Girly. And I find it, and I'm just enthralled by it. I'm enthralled by Oakley Quartz. I'm enthralled by Vanessa Howard's performance. And so 2004 to 2012, I've been thinking about this movie at one point or another. Back to Texas Frightmare Weekend. It's 2013. I have been writing professionally now for a while, for 2020, for Optician's Handbook. And I see that they are going to have a booth here at Texas Frightmare Weekend for Rue Morgue Magazine. And the first day we're there, I think to myself, you know what? I'm going to walk up there and I'm going to pitch this idea. And some intern's going to hear it and he's not going to give a damn. And he's going to say, that's nice. Have a nice rest of the weekend. But you know what? At least I will have done it. Because if I have journalistic backing for this story, if I'm able to go around and say, hey, I'm writing for, tech, uh, for Rumor Magazine, for Fangoria, for whoever, I'd be able to talk to people. You know, maybe I can get a hold of people that Vanessa Howard was in films with. Maybe I can you know, find family and friends of hers and say, hey, I'm writing this article. I'd like to memorialize your friends. Uh, what happened to her? I go up to the booth, just walk up, and I say, hey, my name's Preston Fossil. I write for Optician's Handbook, and I write for 2020 Magazine, and I handed them, I think, a card just for 2020 Magazine that didn't even have my name on it, but just to prove that this existed <laughs> and that I wasn't making up, oh, yes, there's a magazine about eyeglasses, and I write for them. <laughs> all eyeglasses, all the eyeglasses in the world, and I'm the king of the spectacles. <laughs> Hand them this card, say that, uh, yeah, I write for 2020 Magazine, and I've got a killer idea for you. And I laid out the whole story like I did just now, except probably about three times as fast and four times as sweaty. <laughs> and the guy at the booth says, wow, that sounds great. That sounds really interesting. I would like for you to get a hold of me, and let's talk about this more. Hands me his card. We walk away from the booth. I think I went and I looked at action figures or something. And I take the card out, and I'm like, OK, you know, what is this? And it turns out I had just pitched this story to Dave Alexander, who at the time was the editor of Rumor Magazine. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. I just walked up to the editor of this magazine, like one of the biggest horror publications in the world, and just like laid out this whole crazy spiel. Uh, got back from Texas Frightmare Weekend, wrote to him. Uh, we really hit it off. Uh, he didn't necessarily think that there was room in Rue Morgue for the story that I wanted to tell, but he said, uh, you know, I like your writing style from some of the samples that I submitted to him. Would you like to start doing reviews for the magazine? Uh, he says, I know that you're really passionate about uh, Vanessa Howard and about telling her story. It just so happens that Corruption with Peter Cushing is going to be coming out on uh, Blu-ray soon, Laser Killer, a couple of other weird names, it's a crazy movie if you ever see it. It's an attempt to rip off both Eyes Without a Face and Goldfinger. <laughs> and if you don't think that's possible, see Laser Killer. And you will see how it is possible to rip off Eyes Without a Face and Goldfinger. And you'll see super fishbowl lenses on a really sweaty Peter Cushing strangling hookers. <laughs> it is not a good movie. <laughs> but Dave Alexander says, hey, would you like to write about this? Would you uh, like to start doing reviews for us? And so there accidentally began, right here at Texas Frightmare Weekends, my writing for Rue Morgue. Uh, over time, I started doing interviews with them, started doing feature articles for them. Uh, Dave got me into writing for the blog for Rue Morgue uh, with Andrea Subasati, who at the time was the uh, blog editor and is now the editor of Rue Morgue. Uh, she just took over earlier this year. And I have uh, nothing but the uh, utmost confidence that she's going to take the magazine in some really cool and interesting directions. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, through meeting people who wrote for Rue Morgue, through beginning to meet other people in the horror community, I found out about a publication called Scream Magazine, uh, S-C-R-E-E-M. There is one S-C-R-E-A-M. Uh, I've never worked with them. But uh, S-C-R-E-E-M, they're based out of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, run by a fellow named uh, Daryl Mayeski. Uh, I got a hold of him, pitched him the Vanessa Howard story, laid out the whole saga for him much more cohesively in an email, because I'm a much better communicator in writing than I am speaking. And he loved the story, too. And so over the course of the rest of 2013, moving into 2014, I wrote the Vanessa Howard story. 
Uh, I worked with a couple of other guys who I met uh, through the internet in England, uh, a guy named uh, Richard Halfhide and a guy named uh, Ron Seneskal, uh, were tremendous uh, writers, tremendous researchers who helped me get my hands on stuff that I never would have gotten my hands on, uh, birth records, uh, death certificates, all the stuff related to the history and the topography and the geography of Vanessa Howard's life. Uh, found out that her father was a German POW during World War II. That was something that her grandson didn't even know. Uh, ended up getting in contact with her grandson, finding out about you know his memories of his mother growing up. And in the uh, spring issue of Scream Magazine 2014, Remembering Vanessa ran. And that was just fantastic. That was great. Uh, continued writing for Rue Morgue. Uh, I can't remember who said it. A friend of mine posted something on Facebook once. Uh, not to try and get in with a popular crowd, not to try and force yourself to make friends with people, but just to do what you love and do it well and do it right. And the friends that you will make will be the friends that you were meant to have. And that really proved true for me. Uh, the guy who delivered our UPS packages to Texas State Optical was a guy named Corey Brown. And I'm sorry he's not here today because he is one of the most fun people to talk horror movies with. He is one of the biggest horror fans I've ever met. And he was like a really bright point in my day selling glasses. If the day was in the doldrums, if the day was really crummy, I could look forward to Corey bringing in some frame shipments and he and I would just shoot the breeze for 10, 15 minutes. No, not that long. He's a great delivery driver. If UPS is watching this, he deserves a raise and a gilded truck. But uh, he and I would just chit-chat about horror movies. And he told me, you know, a buddy of mine named uh, Jesse Hobson is uh, starting up this website called Cinedump.com. And it's going to be general pop culture. It's going to be all kinds of movies, uh, television, reviews, interviews. Uh, he has, like, sources and resources. Uh, but, you know, it'd be really cool if, you know, you got in touch with him because I bet he'd really love to have you writing for the magazine as well. A uh, website. I got magazines in the brain now. Mm -hmm. And so said, okay, get me in touch with him. Got a hold of Jesse. He's the gentleman running the camera right now. Hi, Jesse. Jesse's waving from behind the camera. Uh, he and I talked for a while. And... Uh, a couple of my uh, articles that had been uh, on some different websites went out of print because the websites revamped, uh, new webmasters took over, they were deleting all the old content, it was going to be a fresh start. And I had some fantastic material out there and it just broke my heart. Uh, I had written this essay about the uh, Blu-ray release of Sleepaway Camp, which I absolutely love and I really put a lot of work into this essay about uh, Sleepaway Camp. And when I found out that that was getting taken offline and that wasn't going to be out there anymore, it just absolutely broke my heart. And I got a hold of Jesse and I says, you know, I know that you've wanted me to write for you for a while. And I know that this is probably a really shitty way to start a writing relationship. But this article that really means a lot to me is going offline. And I have gotten a hold of the new webmaster and the new webmaster says, you know, we do not mind if this article is reproduced elsewhere as long as due credit is given that it originally appeared on X website. And I says, hey, Jesse, will you save this article? Will you put it on the website? Just credit to the original place so this is still out there for people to read. And I'll, you know, write something else for you. And wonderfully, beautifully, Jesse says, yes, there's no problem with that. And he saved the Sleepaway Camp article of mine and started writing for Cinedump and turned out that Jesse had some really interesting contacts as well. He had been working in entertainment journalism for a couple of years himself, had met his own strange and interesting and fascinating and sexy and exciting people and wild and crazy people and all sorts of bizarre individuals. And so I started writing for Cinedump then. Uh, and the fascinating thing about Cinedump is two years ago, we looked at our Alexa rating. It was something like 25 million, I think. 25 million, 30 million. It was like, it was a grain of sand on the beach. And over the course of two years, we are now, as of the last time I checked last week, we are the 1.1 millionth 
most viewed website in the world on Alexa, if Alexa's not lying to me and trying to get me to give them money. <laughs> Hope not. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've just been slowly building uh, interviews, news. It's uh, just all been a process. Uh, interesting thing that I learned out, bleh, interesting thing that I learned doing movie reviews for Rue Morgue for Cinedump was if you've got credentials behind you, if you've written one review, most DVD places, most movie studios will think if you're good for one review, you're good for 20 more reviews. Um, I think maybe about 25% of the DVDs that I own now were screeners that were sent to me to do reviews for. You know, you get a hold of, you know, X releasing house, tell them I want to write a review about this movie. As long as you actually get that review published, they see that you're good, they'll just keep sending you stuff. Sometimes I go to the mailbox and I've got all these things I haven't asked for in there. Hmm. Uh, so that's how Texas Frightmare Weekends got me into horror journalism. 2014 turned out to be an interesting year too because this is how Texas Frightmare Weekend gets me into horror writing. Uh, for as long as I can remember, I always wanted to be a writer, a uh, fiction writer. Journalism had not really occurred to me that much aside from writing a few equally pissy letters for the school newspaper. Pissiness seems to be my default in journalism. Uh, when I was in college, I had written some short stories for my college's literary magazine. Uh, for junior college, I went to a school called Lone Star College uh, in Conroe, Texas. It was a community college, but it was fantastic. And uh, they uh, published a literary arts journal called Swirl Magazine. And it was the literary arts journal of Lone Star College and of Montgomery County, Texas. And I used to submit stories to them. And for a while there, I was getting stories regularly published in Swirl Magazine. And for a while, I thought, OK, that's going to be the extent of you getting stories published. Uh, and while I'm talking about this, I just have to give a shout out to a gentleman named Cliff Hutter. Uh, he was the editor of Swirl Magazine then. He's still the editor of Swirl Magazine now. And I appreciate that he actually published some of the stuff I wrote because it was pretty grisly for a community college literary arts journal in Conroe, Texas. But I do really appreciate that. Uh, but for years, I've always been thinking about writing my own 1980s horror story. You know, going back to my brother and I going to Hollywood Video on all those Friday nights and looking at all those VHS boxes and going back even further to uh, St. Louis where we lived when I was like six, seven years old and they had a video store there called Schnooks that it seemed like Warehouse Market also carried every movie in the world and I saw video boxes when I was six for movies that I don't think I'm old enough to see now. And uh, thinking to myself about what stories are behind all of these. Um, guy who made Beyond the Black Rainbow, Cosmatos? Am I talking, is that the right name? Yeah, yeah thank you. Cosmatos, yes. Uh, you know, he tells that story about going to the video stores when he was a kid and looking at the covers of these horror VHSs and coming up with all these stories in his head. And I think that, that was this profound generational experience. And, you know, I did the same thing. And all those Friday nights in Oklahoma, I thought about what story would I want to tell? What kind of movie would I want to see? And that had just been bouncing around in my head for years, this like 1980s horror saga that I wanted to put to paper. But I could just never figure out what, to, what it would be. I had all these very nebulous ideas, but I just couldn't draw them together. Uh, one of them was a story about a serial killer who thinks that they're the Minotaur because I've just seen this ball drop so many times. I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but that is a cool idea. <laughs> and Dexter has like this killer of the week. It's like, oh, Dexter's gonna hunt down this guy who makes snuff films, and Dexter's gonna hunt down this evil cop who killed her family because she didn't want to go through a divorce. And it's okay, yeah, those are killers of the week. You're gonna have a killer who thinks he's the Minotaur, and that is gonna be your villain of the week? And Dexter's going to, like, kill this guy over the course of one episode? It's like, no, you shouldn't have had Jimmy Smith in season three as the bad guy. You should have had the Minotaur killer in season three as the bad guy. 
And then the Venture Brothers does it, and the monarch goes crazy because Dr. Girlfriend leaves him. She knows what I'm talking about. And for one episode, the uh, monarch thinks that he's the Minotaur and like brings people to the uh, cocoon to run through a maze. And it's like, okay, so you've dropped the ball, you've turned it into a joke. Uh, then there's the Minotaur in American Horror Story, season three. And he dies like off camera in one episode. You're gonna have like a Minotaur super killer. You're gonna have like this giant bodybuilder with the head of a bull who's like 200 years old and he's gonna die off screen in one episode. That's terrible. <laughs> that is untapped potential. And so for the longest time, I had bounced around this idea of I'm going to, you know, I wanna tell this story about a serial killer who thinks that they're the Minotaur. But I could never figure out well, who is this killer going to fight? And who's going to be my good guy? And where is it going to be set? And what's the whole story going to be? And Texas Frightmare 2014, a recurring theme that I kept running into that year was the lack of good roles for women in horror. Uh, that other than Final Girls and Scream Queens, you know, I heard a lot of different filmmakers I talked to that year. I heard a lot of uh, different horror fans I talked to that year, all independent of one another, kind of saying the same thing. Why isn't anybody writing any good roles for women in horror that isn't take your top off and die? Where are our heroines? Where are our villainesses? Why isn't that there? And that started to get the gears moving. And at that point, 2014, I had not written any fiction for two years. 2012 at that point was the last time I had written any kind of fiction. Uh, my wife loved one of the minor characters that I used to have in my stories from college and she had always asked me, well, what's this guy's story? He's always just this bit player. He's like this evil psycho movie projectionist who works at this like sleazy theater on 42nd Street in the 1970s and he's always a big character in your short stories. Why doesn't he get his own story? So in 2012 for our anniversary I wrote her his story. I wrote the short story that was like his tale, what's his deal? And that was the last time I'd written any kind of fiction for two years. And 2014 rolls around, I'm here at Texas Frightmare Weekend, I'm talking to all these different people, they're all saying the same thing, where are good roles for women in horror? and the gears start moving. Because I'm thinking to myself, yeah, where are they? Uh, one of my absolute all-time favorite movies is Night of the Comet. Uh, and that was very formative for me in terms of what I considered to be a good horror movie, what I considered to be a good movie, what I considered to be good writing for characters. And the two girls from Night of the Comet I had always just thought were like two of the most absolute, most wonderful characters ever put in a sci-fi movie or a horror movie. And here at Texas Frightmare Weekend, I'm thinking, okay, yeah, well, why? aren't there more people like that in horror films? Why don't we have more Girls from Night of the Comet? Why don't we have more Kelly Maroney's? Why don't we have more Sam Melmonts? Okay. Um, same year, I uh, was talking to the Soska sisters. They're here this year as well. And just kind of shooting the breeze, BS. And Jen Soska says to me, uh, what are some of your favorite Polish swear words? Because I had said something like, uh, my family's Polish. And she says, oh, our family's Hungarian. Uh, what swear words do you know in Polish? My favorite Hungarian swear word is kurva. It means whore. Turns out it's the same in Polish and most Eastern European languages. It's like the universal word of Eastern Europe. I don't know what that means. <laughs> And I don't, this gives you some insight into the way my mind works. My first thought when she said that was, huh, Curva, wouldn't that be delightful? A character who is a prostitute whose last name is Curva. And I had my story. I knew it. I knew who was going to fight my Minotaur killer. I says, serial killers often prey on sex workers. They, yeah. Mine's blanking out now. But I knew. I just knew from that moment. Uh, the next week after Texas Frightmare Weekend, I went and visited my brother in Oklahoma. Uh, we climbed Turkey Mountain in Tulsa. And on this trek up Turkey Mountain, I laid out for you the entire story. I don't know if you remember this. Yep. And I was like, hey, Brian, I've got an idea for a horror story. And I just laid out everything from beginning to end. There's this girl. And her name's Ginny Curva, and she is a hooker in Times Square in 1983. And there is a serial killer who thinks they're the Minotaur, and it's a woman. 
and she works at a garbage dump, Staten Island, Fresh Kills Landfill, one of the largest garbage dumps in the world. You can see it from outer space. And there's this woman named Nicolette, and she is the uh, safety inspector for this dump. And so she's got free reign of the landfill, and she can go anywhere she wants to there, and nobody's going to question it. And it's so big that you can get lost there. And she thinks she's the Minotaur and that this garbage dump is her labyrinth, it's her maze. And she goes to 42nd Street and she kidnaps people and takes them back to the garbage dump and hunts them. Except Ginny is brilliant and she's smart and she's got this tragic backstory why she's a 21-year-old science savant who's working as a hooker on 42nd Street. And she and Nicolette are going to cross paths and it's going to be this like, bombastic 1980s neon green and pink new wave serial killer showdown. Brian's like, sounds pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Let's go get a beer. And came back and every night from the night that I got back to Texas until I was done, I sat and wrote this story. It was just, it was just kismet. It was the stars aligning. Uh, go to work, come home on I-45. If there's anybody from Houston here, I-45 deserves credit for part of the story because I would sit in traffic for two and a half hours to make a 30 minute drive and could feel what it felt like to be trapped in a horrible world. <laughs> uh, would brainstorm what I wanted to write about. I would get home, have dinner, every night from June of 2014 until November of 2014 for at least two hours Monday through Friday, at least one hour on Saturday and Sunday, every night would sit there and write. And finally got this book written. It was the first time I had written a book, written anything that I really thought could stand up to actual publication. And, wow. And that's turned into 2015 and most of 2016. If uh, writing a horror novel, if writing a horror story is one of the greatest experiences you will ever have than trying to get it published is one of the worst. Because every time it was like skeet shooting, it was like I was throwing up the disc and publishers were ch -ch <laughs> Do you want to publish this? <laughs> Pull! <laughs> I think I got shot down, literally and figuratively, by about 15 or 16 different publishers who actually bothered to respond over the course of 2015 and 2016 and was not getting anything. And then late last summer, uh, I found out about a small publisher based in Georgia, Upstart, called Fearfront. Uh, because I had gotten to thinking, you know, I'm trying to go for the bigger publishers. You know, I'm trying to write to, excuse me, St. Martin's. I'm trying to write to Viking. I'm trying to write to, you know, yada, 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 yada. I'm not getting anything. And when I went to high school, my sophomore year, sophomore year creative writing teacher was PC Cast. I uh, don't know if anybody here, House of Night novels, they're like uh, kind of young adult vampire fiction. And you know everything, you know exactly, you know my story. Uh, she uh, started out as a high school English teacher and a high school creative writing teacher. And the year that I had her, she had just gotten her very first novel, Goddess by the Snake published, and she had it published through this smaller regional publisher and then really worked to promote it, really worked to get it out there, and then she ended up getting picked up by, I think it is St. Martin's that publishes her now. And you know, you go to a Barnes & Noble uh, back when we still had Borders, if you go into a Borders, uh, if you go into a Half Price Books, which I recommend everybody do while you're here, they've got a booth here at the convention, some great stuff there, but if you go to a Half Price Books, you'll see PC Cast Books. And I started thinking to myself, well, all these other guys are giving you, know, you know, the 12 gauge treatment. Uh, start hitting up the regional. Start hitting up the smaller publishers. Because if the big guys don't want to give you the time of day, why are they worth your time? And so I started sending stuff to the regional publishers. Got a letter, I believe it was September maybe last year, October, saying, you know, this is Fearfront Publishing. I'd like to pick up your book. And in December of last year, um, you got him? Bag. Our Lady of the Inferno went into uh, print last year, paperback. It's also available on Kindle. Uh, you can pick it up on Amazon. You can pick it up uh, barnesandnoble.com. 
Uh, we're working on getting it into brick and mortar stores, but in the time being, Amazon.com is probably going to be your best bet. If anybody uses Kindle, available on Kindle. Um, which kind of brings us to right now, present day. You know, this just went into print last December. Uh, it's been getting some good reviews. Uh, Hannah Neurotica, Women Horror Month, gave me my cover quote. Uh, Dave, one of the last things he did before he left through Morgue was give me the back quote, which I'm immensely grateful for. Uh, you know, Dave was always really wonderful to me. So was a fellow by the name of Ron McKenzie, uh, who writes for uh, Blumhouse. They're here too. They've got a wonderful blog. They've got great articles out there. Uh, I recommend definitely checking out the Blumhouse blog, especially the creepy pasta column they've got. Uh, Blumhouse has this incredible creepy pasta column. Has told me, bless you, <laughs> bless you. Uh, has uh, incredible stories about creepy pastas you might never even have heard of. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, and just recently, uh, Izzy Lee of uh, Birth, Death, Movies, and Diabolique gave me another wonderful review, which I'm incredibly grateful for. And uh, things have just been moving forward. Uh, that sort of brings me to now. That's kind of the trajectory I've taken. Uh, my feet are kind of killing me because I really danced a lot last night at Outpost 31. So I'm going to take a seat now and uh, I guess open up the floor to uh, any questions anybody has. And I've got one right here. Uh, when you're submitting to, for lack of a better word, more reputable places, uh, their reputation is kind of staked on their reliability and their journalistic integrity. Uh, so in my experience, that has really not been an issue. Uh, I've always gotten fair credit from Rue Morgue. I've always gotten fair credit, of course, on Cinedump. Uh, I'm the assistant editor of Cinedump now, so I can watch my own back on that. But you know, before that, even Jesse's were great. Uh, but if you're submitting to some place that's been being published for a while, that has a, repu a reputation, uh, you know, your word is uh, your word and your name is a lot. Uh, so. The, the funny thing is the only time that has ever happened has been in the optical world. There was a smaller rival optical publication in 2020 that plagiarized part of one of my articles about eyeglasses. So go figure, in the entertainment world, everybody played square. In the optical world, somebody stole my writing. <laughs> uh, one of the best things that I can recommend for anybody writing fiction is to find readers. Uh, when you're in the early stages, your readers are going to be your biggest resource. Uh, at the time, uh, my big primary reader was my wife. Uh, she's as big a horror fan as I am. Grew up watching really nasty movies on the Sci-Fi Network. Uh, and is also an English teacher, so I could rely on her on multiple fronts. And I would show her a chapter when I was done with it. Uh, we still got time, sweetie. Go ahead and sit down. Oh. <laughs> uh, and so I could rely on her word. And then I also had other friends who were horror fans, other friends who were uh, people who knew English well. And I just had people reading this, letting me know, you know, what's this feedback? What's this feedback? Uh, part of it is going to be trusting them. Part of it is also going to be trusting yourself and being able to say for yourself, okay, this is good. I've reached an intersection between what I want out of a story, what I think other people are going to like out of a story. Um, go in order, here. That first year, that kind of is what I did. I did just blurt it out, it was insane. It was just like, hey, my name is Preston Fossil, I write for 2020 Magazine, I'm a big fan of your magazine, and I've got blah, 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 blah. So, uh, But over time, what I realized is when you're pitching something, don't think of it as, a magazine pitch, think of it as you're trying to sell a friend of yours on watching this with you, or try and sell a friend of yours on reading this book that you enjoyed. Uh, you're not trying to get a magazine to publish you, you're trying to get a friend to enjoy something you did. You really want that passion to come out in it. Uh, and the other thing that I found really helps is telling them what sort of audience uh, is going to be there for this. Um, like with the Vanessa Howard thing, uh, Brit horror fans. Uh, Brit horror is a big thing, of course, in England and in the United States. It's more of a subculture, but it's a very vibrant subculture here of people who like the Hammer films, the Amicus films. And I remember saying uh, later on, writing about another Brit horror piece, you know, uh, you know, I love this movie and it's great because X, Y, Z. And then also, you know, there's a lot of people out there who love movies like this and they're not getting the articles that they would like. And so this would be great for them as well to get them interested. 
Uh, best thing you can do when pitching is uh, sell them on it with the passion that you have for it. Uh, of course, have an idea first, have sources, and have why they should run this. That's one of the beautiful things about independent publishing right now is because they have not been tainted by marketers. Uh, and I hate to defame marketers because I was one for a while, but uh, marketers really have sort of taken over the part of the entertainment industry. I'm not going to say the entertainment industry as a whole, but a sizable part of the entertainment industry has been taken over by marketers and by focus groups. Uh, back when I was in college, I briefly worked at a radio station uh, and uh, one of the guys who worked there was a gentleman by the name of Dan Gallo, who's been in Texas radio for generations. And if you've listened to radio in Texas, you know this guy's voice. And he kind of was able to give me a picture of the way that radio had changed from the 1960s to the present day and how DJs and radio personalities were killed by marketers because they would put together focus groups and determine, well, what does... Uh, what do people 20 to 35 want to hear on their way home from work? What do people 35 to 52 want to hear when they're sad on a Monday? And they just broke it down and broke it down and broke it down to the point that that's the reason you're only hearing 15 songs on a given station is because some focus group somewhere told marketers that this is what they want when this focus group is probably representative of you know, some shopping mall in Akron. Uh, but independent publishers have not really been tainted that way because they're just publishing what they want to publish, what they feel people want to read, not because of focus groups, but because they are genre fans, because they are horror fans, sci-fi fans, uh, because they like romance novels. And because they are fans of this and because they have the passion for this, they've got their thumb on that pulse. And so they're able to say, yeah, let's publish this book. Maybe it won't fly with 25 to 30-year-olds coming home on a Tuesday afternoon on 620, but it's going to appeal to the people who really love this genre. It's going to appeal to the people who really have a passion for this, and that's what we want to do. You've been very patient, please. Uh, when, I got, uh, when I got the book picked up for publication, uh, the uh, publisher did have a professional editor on staff, a uh, woman. I do not know if I'm pronouncing this name correctly. Uh, Majanka Vestrate, I believe it is. And Majanka, if I'm saying that wrong and you're watching this, please forgive me. Uh, but uh, yeah, she, uh, she is responsible for this being readable. Uh, I'm a very stream of conscious writer. Uh, she very wisely advised me that that one page sentence was not a good idea. <laughs> uh, so she helped to put that into a readable form. Uh, the other benefits that I had were uh, I do professional editing work for 2020 and so I was able to uh, to a certain extent to do my own editing and then my wife with her English background was able to do some editing on it as well. Once I had the book finished when I was ready to start submitting it for publication uh, she went and gave it a read through and she did edits on it so I had the benefits of myself and two other editors take a look at this and uh, that's something else with having your readers uh, if some of your readers are people with an English background or who are just very astute with English uh, that'll be a tremendous benefit there I'm going to do the second one first because that's a little bit easier. Okay. Uh, for me, it was actually more difficult to get into the journalism side of it in the first place because uh, fiction was my passion and fiction was more of my background. I've been writing fiction in high school, writing fiction in college. And so for me, it was really more uh, finding my journalistic voice. Uh, that was what was more difficult. And that honestly took me a while because I didn't know how uh, rigid I should be, how formal I should be, should I be informal. And uh, thankfully, with the different types of journalism I was doing, it was more conducive to more of a flip, wry, kind of funny, informal style of writing. Uh, I really think that the article where I found my voice with Rue Morgue was this uh, profile I did of Jessica Cameron, who made uh, Truth or Dare and I did this profile of these three different film projects she worked on and when I wrote the article uh, I've been reading James Elroy recently and uh, I just remember whenever he is writing in his books as a journalist uh, he's doing this parody of 1950s yellow journalistic style a lot of alliteration a lot of slang and it's like bombastic babes and bros burn down barrio and more bombastic whatever and I was like you know I'm writing about these uh, these independent horror movies and it's uh, stuff about like uh, killer hitchhikers shot in the desert and it's all these people in an RV and it's like why not 
not. That's a very like crazy story to tell. So tell that story a little bit more crazy. And so the article I submitted for that was just filled with all this alliteration and like very vivid, wild imagery. And that got a good reception. I said, okay, you know, I, I found that journalistic voice. And then the same thing with 2020. Uh, I kind of adopted that style of writing my articles like I am some Madison Avenue agent in the 1960s pitching a product to somebody. And if you read my optical writing, which would be really flattering if anybody in here did. Uh, if you read my optical writing, it, uh, it does sound like that. And I forgot the first part of your question. What do you look for? Um, quality of writing is paramount above everything else. Uh, if you get an interview with the ghost of Christopher Lee and you can prove to me that you like summoned Christopher Lee from beyond the dead through some either holy or unholy means and you interviewed him, but you submit an article that is absolutely terrible, it does no good. Uh, quality of writing above all else because a quality writer can make the smallest thing exciting. Uh, I've seen other writers at Rue Moore get scream at different places that I have written and worked for, take like some bargain basements, like DVD movie of the week that you see on the bottom shelf at Walmart on Tuesday when they get the new stuff in, and they have watched that and they have really found something in there to be passionate about and found this really incredible performance in there, or really incredible cinematography, and they have turned this into something that I want to see where I'm going to go out to Walmart and I'm going to spend the $4.99 to get this and I'm going to watch it and I'm going to see it through this person's eyes and I'm going to absolutely love it. And then I've seen terrible writers, you know, get the interview with, uh, I haven't seen it with Steven Spielberg, I'm just going to use that as an example, you know, get Steven Spielberg, get George Lucas, and they have turned in absolutely awful articles that should have been incredible. So you've got to be a quality writer. You've got to be able to turn your inner passion into something that is readable and engaging and wonderful. And that is the big thing that I look for and that I think any editor does. Check it out. Check it out. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that it was an advantage for me to have that writing background with 2020. But something that I've learned in the meantime up to now is that uh, the advantage wasn't a necessity. Uh, as long as the idea is good, as long as the writing is good, and as long as you have got a quality pitch and you know the material you're doing with, uh, most places will be very open to picking up your idea and potentially running it. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have that background. You can kind of literally walk in off the street with a good idea and get your foot in the door that way. Uh, especially right now with uh, horror journalism being kind of a, I don't want to say struggling because I don't think struggling is the right word. I think it's as vibrant as it ever was, but it's trying to find its place right now. Print, online, uh, podcasts, what does the future look like? And that has not been decided yet. Uh, there is no answer to that yet. And because there is no concrete future of horror journalism, uh, you can kind of help define that. And so you can, you know, write to Rue Morgue, write to Diabolique, uh, write to Blumhouse, um, something that I didn't include before, uh, but that I'll say now. Uh, I mentioned the gentleman, Ron McKenzie, uh, that I knew at Rue Morgue, who was kind of a horror journalism mentor to me there, uh, was kind enough to recommend me to Blumhouse. And if uh, you'll keep your eye on the Blumhouse blog, you're going to start seeing my name there as well. Uh, that's going to be the... Uh, latest notch in my horror writing belt. Uh, you know, Blumhouse is here. You've got a good idea. Go up to the booth. You know, give them a good pitch. Let them know. You know, do what I did in 2014 because you never know who you're going to run into, who's going to latch on to this idea, who's going to have the passion for what you have, passion that you have for what you have and who's going to share that with you and who's going to want to run with it. Um, growing up, whenever I wanted a new toy or I wanted something, I was always very reluctant to ask for it because I was afraid somebody was going to say no. And my dad's catchphrase, you know, one of his dad aphorisms was, all I can do is say yes or no. You know, if I walk up to, you know, XYZ magazine and say, hey, I want to run this story, if they don't like it, they're not going to beat me up. At least I hope they're not, but they're probably not. But they're going to say yes, and they're going to take it, and you're going to have an article published, or they're going to say no, and you'll be right back where you were before. So, you know, just, just pitch it. Um, setting a schedule is a wonderful thing. 
uh, like when I was uh, selling glasses, uh, I worked uh, 35 to 39 hours a week, uh, Tuesday through Saturday. And what I would do was I'd get off at 5, I'd usually get home around 6.30, 7 o'clock, have dinner. 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock was my writing time. Sequester myself, sit down, write for at least two hours. Um, two hours is not a hard and fast. You know, other people have uh, different obligations. I don't have any kids, uh, so, you know, I was able to say two hours. But, you know, you can make it one hour. You can make it 30 minutes. I'd say 30 minutes should probably be the minimum. I don't know if you can really do something really quality and give it that kind of dedication if it's less than 30 minutes. But if you can find at least that 30 minutes, set that 30 minutes aside at a definite time every day and make that your writing time. And uh, maybe it's in the morning. Uh, you know, my wife works with uh, the school system. She does her writing in the morning. She gets up uh, about half an hour earlier, and she does her writing in the morning before she goes to work. And then when she comes home at night, you know, crashes and does her routine. Um, for a while there, uh, my uh, optical writing, I was doing on my lunch break at work. I uh, would either bring my laptop to work or, you know, longhand record, have a sandwich, go in the back room, and I would write articles on my lunch break. I wasn't doing anything better with my time. Uh, but as long as you can set that schedule, uh, then you can keep yourself dedicated to it. Um, but really, uh, I, used to, uh, I used to lift weights back when I was in college until I messed up my rotator cuff or my clavicle, according to some other doctors. Uh, but uh, it's a very, I gave the same dedication to that that I gave to my gym routine. You know, I had uh, certain days were going to be this type of workout. You know, I had my back days, my arm days, my leg days. Uh, same thing. Uh, Mondays were my uh, journalistic writing because uh, uh, we all work Tuesday through Saturday. So Monday, do journalistic stuff. Uh, Tuesday, uh, the rest of the week, do my creative writing at night. Of course, I was doing it Monday nights too. But it's, it's all about scheduling. And if you can set that schedule, then you can uh, you know, work with that. Did that answer it? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Horror film writing and then horror film oh, definitely. Uh, the, the horror film world, um, for lack of a better word, is incestuous, not in the creepy way, but that like everybody, if, if the rest of the world is six degrees of separation, then the horror world is like two and a half degrees of separation. Uh, if you meet one person, then they're going to know, you know, ten other people. Uh, you know, to go back with Blumhouse, uh, Ron McKenzie from Room Org knew Rebecca McKendry from Blumhouse and is the one who recommended me to, uh, to her. Uh, Dave Alexander knew a couple of different people who he uh, set me up on interviews with. Uh, you know, X person knows Y person and they were happy with the quality of my writing and they said, hey, you know, Johnny, you've got this movie coming out in two weeks. Uh, I really like the coverage that Preston gave me. Uh, why don't you send him a screener and uh, if he likes it, you know, he can give you good coverage as well. Uh, so, you know, that has been a tremendous uh, benefit to me on my trajectory through the horror world. Uh, you know, I uh, met uh, Hannah Neronica through somebody, and she gave me, you know, a positive cover quote for my book. You know, she loved the, the quality of the writing, and she knew me as a quality writer, which uh, is what gave her the confidence to pick this book up in the first place. It wasn't just, you know, some guy coming up to her like, hey, my name is Teddy and I write books. Would you like to read my books? I've written a story I think you'll like. No, it's because I, I had a reputation as a quality writer. She had seen my writing before and so she was willing to give it a shot and ended up liking it. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely, definitely true and it's, an, it's a definite benefit as well. Of course, the flip side of that is don't piss somebody off. Uh, so the, the one, if there's a big piece of advice that I can give today, if there is one walk away from it, it's that a kind word and good manners will get you further than a lot of other things. Uh, of course, you've still got to be a quality writer. You've still ha got to have a good product. But if it comes down to me and I say thank you and please and I appreciate your time and it's been a pleasure to speak to you and you've got another guy who says, okay, tell me about this movie. Okay, thanks. Yeah, bye. Um, you know, I'm going to be the one who's going to be remembered more favorably, and I'm going to be the one who is going to be recommended to other people to look at their stuff. Um, just, just be nice. Just be courteous. Be polite. It's going to be very difficult at times, but you know, keep the fanboy or fangirl impulse under control. 
Uh, back in the early days, I think I freaked a lot of people out just because I didn't have that a handle on that. I think I might have freaked Kane Hodder out last year, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, just, just, you know, pretend that you're talking to, you know, a coworker that you're not that familiar with. Uh, and you're just sitting down and having a cup of coffee and chit-chatting. Uh, one of the best interviews I ever had was with uh, Sadie Katz. Uh, she's the, uh, the killer in Wrong Turn 6, uh, scorned. And, uh, you know, the interview I had with her it was basically just us chit-chatting about uh, the horror movies that we grew up with and our shared experiences of uh, going to video stores. And then that kind of organically turned into the kind of movie she was in and the kind of movie she made. And it really was just two people kind of shooting the breeze and, uh, you know, enjoying an afternoon. Um, other people prefer a more formal approach. Uh, you know, I, I use the expression, give them the British treatment, uh, this very, you know, polite, formalized, uh, you know, question and answer session, figure out what they want, what kind of, uh, you know, way they want to be addressed and regarded. But the one thing nobody wants is to be treated rudely. And as long as you're polite, as long as you're kind, courteous, respectful, uh, many doors will open. That was actually during the writing process. When I started writing it, uh, I had intended it to be either a short story or a novella. I did not think that it was going to turn into what it turned into. And uh, if you read the book, which I hope everybody in here does, Amazon.com, uh, there is a, uh, there's a set piece near the beginning of the story uh, between these two women at a bus stop. And it was originally supposed to be this very brief conversation between these two women at the Port Authority. Um, there's a book called Sleazoid Express. I've just got to get a plug in here for it now. I read the hell out of that thing back in 2004 while I was still in high school. Spent many an afternoon on the living room floor. You remember me reading that thing. It is one of the best books that you will ever read on exploitation cinema or grindhouse movies. Uh, and just because of the role that the Port Authority played in the culture of 42nd Street, I just have to get this in here. And so it was really just meant to be this very brief conversation between these two women at the Port Authority just so I could get that shout out in there. And this conversation started to get longer and more interesting and things that I didn't think were going to be addressed started to come up. And like ideas that I hadn't thought of tackling started to develop. And things about this one character that I didn't know about her started to kind of reveal themselves to me. And I started to learn things about her that I hadn't necessarily learned. And it was over the course of that scene that I realized this is not a short story. This is not a novella because I can't develop the things that are starting to spring up with just a short story or a novella. And so that's kind of how that happened. It was, uh, it was a very fascinating process because it all happened very organically. Characters changed from my original conceptions of them. Aspects of the story changed. Uh, it sounds crazy to people who don't write, but I think that anybody in here who has ever attempted fiction knows the phenomenon of your characters coming to life on their own and things that you had planned for your characters maybe not necessarily being appropriate because that's not true to the character and they stop being something that you have complete control over and they become a real person whose story that you are telling. Uh, the, the original draft, the earliest draft, is a lot nastier. Uh, my idea was I was just going to just write it all as it came to mind, make it as sleazy as seemed appropriate at the time because I can always take it out later. Uh, and then, you know, over the course of telling the story, realized that it's not a it's a dirty story and it's a nasty story, but it was a story that was more conducive to that nastiness being between the lines. Uh, I'm one of those people who believes that what your imagination comes up with is more horrible than what you necessarily show. And so, uh, you know, there are a couple of gore set pieces in there. Uh, I kept a leash on those. Uh, some of the aspects of the culture I was dealing with I thought were better left between the lines. Uh, do you remember the plunger treatment got taken out? Yeah. That was a good idea. Um, you will never know what I'm talking about. Uh, something that didn't belong in there that I took out. Um, but uh, really just uh, you know, understanding the tone of what you're working on and what does and doesn't belong in there uh, according to what is true and what feels right to the story that you're telling. Uh, um, this is probably, um, I talked about how I had not written for two years before I wrote this. I'd written that short story 
and I had written those short stories in college for Swirl Magazine. Those all came from something that I called the theater story. And the theater story is now a dead and abandoned 250,000 word monster, <laughs> still incomplete, sitting on some forsaken hard drive somewhere that will probably never see the light of day in any form. Um, this book was me learning to get a handle on that and uh, learn control and learn it not getting too long. Uh, actually, this here now, it's, uh, how many pages is this? It's 292 pages. Uh, and this is the abbreviated version because when I finished this, when I had it in that editing process, it was probably about another. 7,500 pages longer. And I had to really sit down and say to myself, what belongs in here that is necessary for the story? What isn't necessary but is good and gives it flavor and gives it depth? And what is completely extraneous? Um, the one big scene that I remember that I took out is there's a scene in the first third of the book where my main character is having coffee with a woman she works with at a coffee shop in New York. And originally, there was probably like this five page long history of that coffee shop and the people who came there and the role that this coffee shop played in the Times Square vice trade and how it was like this converging point for hookers and drug dealers and pimps and other people on Times Square. And it was like this reliable place for them to come to. And there was like this whole history of it. And that's interesting. It's a cool idea. It might make a good little short story on its own. Uh, just for me, developing the story, it was a nice character sketch, but did it necessarily belong in the book as the final product? No. Uh, and so as disappointing as it was to me to have to carve that out because I really loved the writing in it, I had to say that that falls into that third category of not necessary to the story. I, w I wish I did, but I don't. Um, Fear Front I found accidentally. That's kind of a funny story. Um, you know, I was talking before about how you make connections in the horror worlds and people like what you've written and they'll refer you to other people. And somebody had sent me a friend request on Facebook uh, wanting me to look at a manuscript they had written. And they had on their Facebook page that they were submitting to Rob DeLauro at Fear Front Publishing. And that's how I found out about Fear From Publishing was somebody trying to get me to read their writing. And I says, oh, I've never heard of them before. Uh, let me take a look. Let me give it a shot. And, you know, boom, it did. Uh, you know, going back to, you know, do what you do well and the things that are supposed to come across your path will come across your path as long as you, uh, you know, keep it dedicated to it. Um, but no, unfortunately, I really don't. Um, I would look up poor publishers. Um, there's a woman here. Kate, I've got her card. She makes the most delightful unicorn art. Um, she had this uh, really funny uh, picture that I bought last night, and it's these two unicorns in a library reading books. It says, read, bitches. Uh, <laughs> and she also uh, publishes, too. Let me find her card. She's here, and I have a feeling. Kate Court? Mick Court? Does, ah, did, did I leave her card on the dresser? I've got a very bad habit of coming to Frightmare every year, getting a lot of cards, and then they sit on my dresser until they melt into the wood. Ah, Evil Girlfriend Media, Katie Cord, C-O-R-D. She's got a booth here. Um, you know, can't hurt. Go take a look. Um, and then also Postmortem Press is here. Um, probably the best thing would be to, you know, go out there and just look up uh, horror publishers. You know, of course, I'm in Texas. Fear Front's based out of Georgia. You know, there's some geographical expanse there. Yeah, so, but, you know, just, just look them up because they're out there. Um, I think that that might do it. Um, surprised that I'm actually running on schedule. Really grateful for that, too. Um, in closing, um, thanks again for everybody who turned out. Um, Thanks to Frightmare for having me here. I'm um, really grateful for the opportunities that I've been given, the opportunities that have come my way, uh, the people who've given me chances, uh, the people who've supported me and helped me. If I haven't mentioned anybody, I'm sincerely sorry. Uh, 
enjoy Texas Frightmare. Please support it. Uh, please support Stop the Stigma. Uh, there's a booth out in the lobby. If you haven't seen it, uh, it is a charity organization that was set up by uh, Sue Cryer, the wife of uh, Lloyd, who puts this on. Uh, she and a couple of other people. It uh, helps people who need to get uh, psychological counseling uh, in contact with counselors and therapists and, if necessary, help them pay for it. Uh, it's a really wonderful cause and it's really great that Texas Frightmare has uh, become a part of this and helped partner up with it. Uh, they got a booth out there with more information on the organization. Uh, you can make donations. You can uh, buy merchandise and all the proceeds from purchasing that merchandise will go to Stop the Stigma. Uh, they've got a silent auction going on out there. Uh, you can buy autographed mer uh, bid on autographed merchandise. Once again, all the proceeds from that auction will go to charity and will go to help stop the stigma. Uh, oh, you did? They have one of your books in the silent auction. Oh, yeah, I, I donated a copy to them. Uh, but, yeah, there is a signed copy of my book up there that's part of the auction. Um, I think they got a machete. I haven't been able to get close enough to the table to look. Is it Kane, Kane Hodder? Oh, sweet. Okay, there is a signed machete from Kane Hodder at the Stop the Stigma booth. If nothing else, that is a reason to go up there and bid on something. Um, thank you. Thank you all for coming out. I hope that I've been helpful. I hope I've been informative. I'm on Facebook, uh, Preston Fossil, uh, F-A-S-S-E-L, uh, same as the watch, spelled different. It is literally German for beer barrel. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, but feel free to uh, hit me up on Facebook if you have any further questions or if you just want to add me. Um, and enjoy the rest of Texas Frightmare Weekend. And uh, hey, um, can so if, it's all, if it's cool with everybody here before we go, I'd like to get a picture so I can prove to my mom there was this many people here. <laughs> Do you have like another big idea book? Like it looks like that would have, that had been germinating in your head for a while. Do you have like a another big thing that you've been working you know, on? I do. I do. And let's see if I can get this to work correctly. Oh, I can. Everybody swim, smile, wave. Thank you. And thank you again and enjoy the rest of the weekend. <laughs>